You're listening to Hear Arizona. Addressing issues, empowering our community. Wednesday is Pay What You Wish Day at the Phoenix Art Museum. It's almost always more crowded than usual on Wednesdays, and this one is no exception. I get my ticket, walk through the lobby, past the staircase, up to the historical European masterpieces, and past the event space temporarily filled with college students' work. Finally, I reach another staircase that leads to a kind of tucked away basement. Down there is a room full of thousands of pieces of art made by ordinary people. Some fill up an entire wall. Others lay in a big pile on the ground as tall as a child. It's not as busy and bustling down here as it is upstairs, but people filter in and out, and the art has them talking. I actually have like a lot of family who will yell at each other because of how vastly they disagree. Yeah, I've had a few family members who won't even like talk to me anymore just because I was very vocal about what I believe in. They would call me a child, but I'm like 20. It's like, I know what I believe in. And they would just ignore me and then eventually cut me off completely. Usually it just cuts me off from my family because if I see that they're not willing to have an open mind about things, I just decide to not waste my energy. And it's kind of hard because that's your family. I'm from Mississippi, like racism is definitely blatant in your face. You're always going to connect to somebody that looks more like you. It just depends on how you grew up, where you grew up, what was your environment like. You're going to always stick to that. But as far as uh, reaching across the table and, um, you know, talking to other people who may not look like myself, it, it sometimes it can be a bit challenging, but it's just something that is a good practice for everybody to just jump out your comfort zone. Everyone has their own opinions, but like, have an open mind and like, just listen to what the other side has to say instead of like screaming into each other's like ears and just like your opinion. I'm into art and I used to take art classes in high school and it was hard for me to see those two colors together for some reason. They're so strong by themselves, like a dark blue and like an intense red. And the pandemic hits and we had all these uprisings and then we saw even more disunification or separation. Um, I think it's pretty powerful to come in here and like see the whole sort of a unification here. I mean, you don't have to go on and about about each other's differences if there's the similarities. Two, two colors that make a big statement come together to make whatever person wants to make out of it, it doesn't look bad. On this episode of Here Arizona's State of the Arts podcast, a violent protest. We'll hear from the protest leader and organizer, an Arizona artist who recruited people from all over the country to weave opposing colors, blue and red, together to make a peaceful whole. We'll dive deep into this project and the larger issue of division and political polarization. And we'll ponder how art can make community out of conflict and help us see the world with a little more color and a little more empathy. So for those that are listening to this and aren't able to see the show, uh, I guess I should describe it a little bit. This is Tim Rogers. I'm the Sybil Harrington Director CEO at the Phoenix Art Museum. The Violet Protest has been on exhibition at the museum since March, but it's a living project that's been in the works for more than a year. Local artist Ann Morton is the mastermind behind it all. What she did was she asked a whole community of people who are basically textile artists. Textile artists work with fibers. They knit and weave and make things like tapestries and blankets. And she asked them to create eight by eight squares. Eight by eight inches, that is. Using the colors red and blue, being associated with the Republicans and the Democrats when this project began. And the idea was that it would be done before the election, 
but because of COVID, it went through the election and then into the aftermath of the election as well. I want every American to be prepared for the hard days that lie ahead. The novel coronavirus outbreak spreading across the world. You are looking at live pictures from Minnesota where protests have turned violent. Louisville police shot and killed 26-year-old Breonna Taylor in her apartment. Who left? Will you shut who is up, on, Listen, who is on your list, Joe? Gentlemen, this is Trump. The worst president in American history. America is a very bad place, and it's your fault. He is president-elect Joseph Robinette Biden. The number of voter fraud cases in Philadelphia could fill a library. Look at all of that fake news. It's unbelievable. Hundreds of pro-Trump protesters are outside the Maricopa County Tabulation Center. Right now, 100,000 Americans are hospitalized with the virus. It should have never been allowed to happen by China. This is our, looking at inside, or look at this, these protesters are inside Statuary Hall right now. Rioters taking over the U.S. Capitol building. The most horrifying thing that I have seen in American politics in my lifetime. Americans are deeply divided. This is the time to heal in America. And so all throughout this tumultuous past year in American history, creators across the country have contributed to Anne's big statement of unity. 1,600 people responded to this request. 13,000 squares have been produced to this point. So the walls are covered with these little squares, but then all of the others are stacked up in the center of the room and they form the letters U and S for us, but also for the United States. She calls it the violet protest. That's violet, like the shade of purple that you get when you combine blue and red. And so the protest is really against both of the political parties. I talked to a lot of people for this episode of the podcast, both people who have actively participated in the project, weaving their own squares, and those who just visited the exhibition. One of the hardest parts about being a journalist is finding real-life people who've been impacted by whatever issue it is you're reporting on. That was not the case at all with this story. Everyone's been affected in one way or another by political polarization. I talked to people as young as 19 and as old as 74. I talked to men and women, white, black, and Latinx. I talked to people from all corners of the country, Oregon, Connecticut, Georgia, Arizona, and even Hawaii. When it comes to this topic, everybody has something to say, and everybody agrees on one thing. It's not good. So much more a division in this country is, has been created, and it's, I'm worried that it'll never, it'll never heal. That, that really makes me very sad. I don't want to be divided. There's, you know, it's, it's terrible. It, it affects all of us. These people are just like you and me, and you'll hear from them throughout the episode. And whenever you do, this beat will play to let you know. And what she's hoping for here is unification around kind of shared values. So the idea is values over party. And the specific values Violet Protest promotes are... Citizenship, you know, like with a capital C, not whether you're a citizen or not, but acting as a, as a citizen, as a good citizen. Compromise, country over party and corporate influence courage, um, candor, truth-telling, and compassion and creativity. This is the artist herself, Anne Morton. She sits for hours on end knitting a red and blue flag cover in the exhibition room about twice a week. This public labor is a symbol for the estimated 60,000 hours of work that has collectively gone into the project. She took a break one day to talk to me. We're not talking about immigration. We're not talking about gun control. We're talking about whatever the decision is, can we go back to basics and go back to, you know, decent behavior? At the heart of the Violet Protest is Anne's and her 1,000 plus collaborators love of and belief in their country. The word I use to describe this is one that's become politically charged like so many other things in recent years, patriotism. I do consider that I am patriotic. I think it's just, um, you know, a deep love of the true story of your country's origins. What could be more patriotic than unity in the United States of America? The country that came back together after a civil war and worked as one to defeat Hitler and go to the moon. The country that's never had a military coup or a king or a dictator 
or an alternate leader accepted by certain segments of the population. We wanted to break away from the, the structure of a monarchy. Um, we wanted to have self-determination. That's what I'm patriotic about, is that American story that I grew up believing in, and I want to keep believing in that. When it comes to voting, the most American of activities, Ann said she's never gone strictly along party lines. You know, I mean, I registered as a Democrat as a young person, but it, it didn't occur to me that I couldn't or wouldn't vote for a Republican if I believed that they were the right person for the job. In fact, I believe I voted for um, the elder Bush, H.W. Bush. So if you think about it, Ann's whole violet protest is like a microcosm of government and society as a whole. Contributors agree to follow certain rules, eight inch squares, equal parts blue and red, but no two squares are the same. Some have patterns, others depict nature like birds and cacti, and some have messages such as I'm Edie and I vote or compromise. Each participant expressed their own ideas how only they themselves could, and all their unique and varied work comes together to make a harmonious whole. It's just so um, heartwarming to see people have come in and gasp. They've left in tears because there's so many people and their their work and energy in this room and it's uh you can feel it. I'm from Mississippi so quilts is like a really big um, part of our history part that dates back to slavery so it definitely kind of reminds me of like telling a story. It's just interesting to see like what everybody put together. You know I think the whole imagery of that blue, liberal, uh, red, conservative, and coming together to make uh, Violet is just a beautiful concept. I mean, I feel like there's a certain energy to it because it's from thousands of different people, you know? When the exhibition at the Phoenix Art Museum closes in September, the squares will be packed up, divided equally, and sent to our representatives in Washington, D.C. Our first goal was 50 squares per member of Congress. So if you take the Senate and the House of Representatives, that's 535 people. And times 50 is 26,750. People are still working hard making squares to reach that 26,750 goal. One creator I talked to, Kitty from Pittsburgh, has made 90 and counting. The Violet protest brings to mind another textile-themed piece of activism. In 1987, the massive AIDS quilt was unveiled on the National Mall. It was made up of different pieces people made to honor their loved ones that succumbed to the disease. Well, I actually saw the AIDS quilt out on the National Mall. That quilt, by many accounts, had a huge impact and went a long way toward destigmatizing and raising awareness for AIDS. I asked Anne and many of her collaborators what they hope the members of Congress will think and feel when they receive their squares. Uh, they might, it might evoke a memory where something else wouldn't. We're not asking for them to consider any specific political agenda. We're asking them to go back to the core values that we all teach our kids. I hope they're blown away. Some of these squares, people have poured their heart and soul into them. I have to admit, when I when I started submitting pieces to the project, I thought, I really hope it doesn't go to any of those congressmen or senators I don't like. <laughs> but then I thought, no, that's you know, that sort of defeats the purpose, right? Yeah, I, I hope it makes people smile. I really do. I don't know. I mean, I've thought about that a lot because a lot of people seem to be secure in their beliefs and the idea that somebody's beliefs might be swayed a little bit. I don't know. I just, I don't know. It seems like everyone has a sense that the division and polarization in our country is bad and has gotten worse recently. But I wanted to know if that was really true, so I asked an expert. Uh, my name is Christopher Federico, professor of political science and psychology at the University of Minnesota. Is it worse? Are we more polarized? Uh, well, uh, people are more polarized in some ways than they were 30 or 40 years ago, and in other ways they're not all that much more polarized. Federico makes a distinction between ideology, how liberal or conservative someone is, and political party. He said when it comes to ideology, we're really not more polarized than we have been. There are liberals and there are conservatives, but 
there's a lot of people pretty close to the middle, too. So it's really that partisan identification, whether you identify as a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, if you go back to around the time I was born, which was the early 1970s, um, uh, there were still quite a few conservative Democrats and moderate to liberal Republicans, both uh, in the general public and uh, in Congress. I was very politically active when I was in college. I was definitely involved with uh, the anti-Vietnam War movement, and it was pretty bad then. But this is this is a different level, and I think people have gotten so desperate or so full of fear. This gap is so much wider than I than I I've ever seen before. Yeah. It's hard to imagine a time when political parties and ideology didn't overlap so much, but. Now, of course, they very much do. And the term that we often use to describe this kind of polarization is sorting, actually. Sorting is an important term in the world of political science. It refers to the phenomenon of people sorting into a political party or group based on their specific viewpoints. And what happens in a two-party system when sorting gets to a certain point is the two parties develop strongly opposing views on all kinds of issues. And the people and politicians that have sorted into them kind of have to adopt them all. The average Democrat and the average Republican disagree more strongly on a lot more things. Another part of that is to some extent, uh, positions on a lot of different issues have kind of become more aligned with one another. Another thing that's happening is that more and more things are getting sucked into the political sphere and being associated with one side or another. Masks, red hats, and the NFL now all have some kind of political charge to them. We have evidence of this, that there are sort of general stimulus objects like baseball, SUVs, uh, fancy coffee drinks, now has a partisan flavor to it. And worst of all? To put this simply, uh, people have come to feel a lot more negatively about the party they do not belong to compared to the party they do belong to. I avoid people who are of opposite... <laughs> Um, I'm not, I'm not fond of people who are, are Trump supporters. I'm not. And I know very few. My sister is a staunch Democrat since she's been in high school. We've never been able to talk. It's hard to have her, um, in a group setting when there's other Republicans around. It's better to just save the energy and try to find people who think the same way. I have... A very close friend who voted for the former president, and um, it was very hard to deal with her for a while. You know, I still care about her. She's going through cancer. I'm take, helping take her to treatments, and, you know, we still try and communicate, but there definitely is a red and a blue. There isn't much violet going on anywhere. Partisanship is an identity, like being a supporter of a particular football team. It's an identity, and it's an identity that matters, especially to people who care a lot about uh, politics. It doesn't feel like when I'm at a museum that I'm engaged in some kind of team sport. And I, I think that the world has kind of gone a little too far in that direction. This again is Tim Rogers, Phoenix Art Museum CEO and director. He's only been in charge of the museum since July 2020, and before that, he was a professor of art history and interpretive theory for many years. Art world and museums, that's not what we're about. We don't try to create a, those sense of competition or opposition. It is a sharing of ideas that are oftentimes unexpected and come from different perspectives. Tim told me that the magic of the museum, its ability to present people with surprising new ideas, feelings, and perspectives, that only works if visitors come to the museum with an open mind. I believe in curiosity. I also believe in confusion. I think when you're not uncertain and you're not curious and you absolutely have determined your point of view, that's a really dangerous place to be because then how are we growing as people? And how can we relate to people that are different than us? So art is, in many ways, the anti-politics. Politics is about opposition. Art is about inclusion. Politics is about being convicted and arguing your point. Art is about being open-minded. Art is an, actually a way of knowing. It's a way of knowing yourself. It's a way of knowing the world. This is University of Arizona-based philosopher and art historian Robert E. Gordon. 
And this way of knowing that he's talking about is a kind of mode of being that you can either be in or not. It's a mode where you take in all the surrounding world and appreciate that other human beings with minds and ideas made everything around you. Your running shoes, the old church you run by, and the music you listen to, they were all designed carefully, and they all carry the ideas of their creators in them. This creates what Gordon calls a sense of shared mind. Right, we are in within, in a sense, the mind and the ideas of the people who help create these artworks, these artifacts. You're starting to understand that you're not alone. Being aware of the human ideas all around us, it almost fuses us together with the rest of humanity. And this kind of thing, according to Gordon, is like healthy food for our soul. Life needs life in so many ways. Just like we need to eat organic matter to survive for our bodies, our spirits or our souls need life as well. And so that's one of the things that I think arts do is bring life. And according to Gordon, the way to get into this mind-sharing mode of being is to really consume art. Not just passively use it for entertainment or mood. Listen, watch, or read carefully and reflect on it afterwards. Let it become a part of you. And it doesn't matter if it's, a, it's, you know, if it's Casablanca, right, or if it's the Avengers. If you somehow found a way to assimilate that creative object into your psychology, even a little bit, you know, you've, you've lived, you're living a better life. You're, you're living a healthier life. It all sounds esoteric, but do a thought experiment. You don't care about art and you don't spend much time or effort consuming it. The TV is just a break at the end of the day. The museum is boring and full of irrelevant historical stuff and contemporary art that makes no sense. Buildings are just there. The noise that comes out of the radio is just something to fill the silence. There is a sense that you can live a dead life or live a life that's dead. We, as all humans with minds, have access to all those objects. Once you realize that, you say, wait a minute, oh, that car that you see there is the product of how many minds, hundreds and hundreds of minds, right, together. And even just knowing that puts you in a place, it's not just the car I get into and that's all, but suddenly there's a sense of communal understanding. Now you are inside essentially that mind of the people who created it. You know, instead of looking at art as an object, I think art is a way of being in the world and art is an experience. And um, I mean, at, its, at one level, art is basically about ideas, right? This is Phoenix area based arts journalist, Lynn Trimble. We heard from her in the last episode. And so ideas are those things that we think about in our own lives. We share with our family, with our friends, with our communities, with our societies. And they're things that prompt conversations. And conversations are what make things happen in the world. They make change happen. Each one of these squares represents an idea. I think it's just really interesting how many people were able to share their thoughts instead of using words, they use art. And I think that's really cool. Hearing from Federico, the political psychologist, Gordon, the philosopher of art, and Anne, the artist, it starts to look like our modern day partisan politics and the age old tradition of art are pulling us in opposite directions. In partisan politics, there's only one right idea on any given issue. In art, they're infinite and they come in all shades. Partisan politics, by its nature, splits us apart and declares one half wrong. Art brings us together. It opens our minds and fuses us into one shared mind. It makes us more empathetic and connected to our world. And that is a good thing. That we can agree on. Quit dividing. We need to come together. Yeah, I may be a Trump supporter, but not everything is a Trump supporter. I'm not that way. There's there's both sides, obviously, to every story. But I love all my people. I love my family. They have completely different views from me. A smart person surrounds themselves with people who disagree with them because it helps build you. Really just have to um, be open-minded and really take judgment off the table. Life is too hard to really just have an opinion on everybody else's life. So hopefully we can make a difference. I, you know, we can only try, right? If we don't try, then it gets worse. So I think we need to try. I just kind of think it's amazing that so many people have a different idea of what unity is. But like, as you can see, everyone has vastly different ideas, but they're still together. It's 
You just listened to an entire podcast episode on the arts. So obviously this issue carries some weight for you. To learn more about the organizations we profiled and the issues they face, visit our website, hearearizona.org. That's H-E-A-R Arizona. Tell all your friends to check us out too. They can search for Hear Arizona on their favorite podcast listening app. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, NPR One, Spotify. And since we're all about empowering our community, We want you to be a part of the conversation. Follow Here Arizona on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This podcast series is made possible by a grant from the Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust. Here Arizona is a production of the Division of Public Service at Rio Salado College, which includes Sun Sounds, Spot 127, KBOC, and KJZZ. Special thanks to the Phoenix Art Museum and Ann Morton for their help with this episode. The music in this episode was by me and local Arizona band Towers. This episode was produced, written, directed, and hosted by me, Anthony Wallace. Linda Pastore is our executive producer. Hi, this is Scott Bork from Here Arizona Podcasts. Since you're still listening, you're obviously a fan of ours. We want to hear more from you. Visit hearearizona.org and take our listener survey. That's H-E-A-R Arizona dot org. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.